The UFC 300 massive supercard has just been finalized, so today, guys, we are going to get in an early breakdown and prediction video. We are going to go through the entire card from bottom to top with timestamps if you'd like to skip to any part of the video. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another video. If you are new here, my name is Kyle. I'm your guy with too many YouTube channels, and welcome back to another, like I just said, full card breakdown and prediction video for UFC 300 this time. I cannot wait to talk about this fight, guys. Comment down below what you think. Let's get into it. Starting off with a fight that I cannot believe is opening up a card. We have Davison Figueredo versus Cody Garbrandt. This is a very interesting fight because you have Cody Garbrandt, who is finally, cool. I can't believe what I'm seeing, but he's back on a two-fight win streak against both Trevin Jones and Brian Keller. Now, is this anything to write home about? No, but Cody Garbrandt has looked okay in his last performances. Keyword being okay. He still looked a little bit slow. He started dancing a little bit in one of the performances, but, like, it just wasn't the same. Before that, he had a two-fight losing streak against Kai Kara France and Rob Font, but you're getting into two, three years ago over here. And before that, he had his knockout win against Rafael Sunsell. He's come back from Cody Garbrandt being completely washed, but I still do ultimately think he is a little bit washed. Davison Figueredo, on the other hand, has suffered three losses in his career, and they are all... As of recently, of course, we all know that he lost to Brandon Moreno twice. But other than that, he ended up getting a win over Brandon Moreno. And then he finally had his Bantamweight debut, a long time coming, against Rob Font. Now, it is important to note that I am not as high on Davis and Figueredo at Bantamweight as a lot of people seem to be. Don't get me wrong. He looked good. He had some good moments, but Rob Font had some good moments too. But you could also chalk that up to... Rob Font being a great fighter. He is fighting in the toughest division in all of combat sports. This performance just left me a little bit unsure about how Figueredo is going to do at the top of the Bantamweight division because he really, really lacked his dangerous presence at this division, if that makes sense. We all know Davis and Figueredo, he comes forward and he is a massive, massive powerhouse, a huge guy for the flyweight division, but it didn't feel like that at Bantamweight. And now, you have a question at Bantamweight now. He's 36 years old. I don't love it. I don't love it. But at the end of the day, I do think this is a very good matchup for Davis and Figueredo because you have two guys that are going to want to come here and strike. They do have grappling to back it up, but Davis and Figueredo is definitely the more explosive fighter. He, I would say Garbrandt's a little bit more technical, especially with the boxing, but Garbrandt has looked so slow as of recently. And Davison, I feel like his power will actually come into effect here. Cody Garbrandt, of course, we all know his chin at this point in his career is glass. And over the course of three rounds, Figueredo is quite an accurate striker. I think Davis and Figueredo is going to chin Cody Garbrandt. It's going to be very, very easy. Even if Cody Garbrandt wants to open up the grappling or if he starts being a little bit faster than Davis and Figueredo, I don't think that Cody Garbrandt is going to do anything better than Figueredo, if that makes sense. The only thing that really worries me here is 36 years old, Bantamweight. I don't like that, but he still looked good in his last fight and it wasn't that long ago. It was only three months ago against Rob Font. So, I'm still okay on Davis and Figueredo. My question will be if he fights somebody really, really ranked in the division, especially that like once you get to the Sean O'Malley's, the Marabs, you know, Corey Sandhagen. That's what I think Davis and Figueredo is going to lose. But I think this is a very, very good matchup for him. I think Davis and Figueredo is going to knock out Cody Garbrandt fairly quickly into this bout. Moving on to the next fight, I am very, very excited for this fight. We have Bobby Green taking on Jim. A-10 Miller. Jim Miller is officially not going to get the entrance of Jim Effing Miller. That's what we all know he wanted to see. But Jim Miller, man, fought at UFC 100, fought at UFC 200, and now he's going to fight at UFC 300. And who would have thought at UFC 300, Jim Miller, at 40 years old, almost 41 years old, is on a win streak and has been looking fantastic in his career. I'll start with Jim Miller. His last five, he has had some very very good performances against guys who, there's a little bit of a mixture, of course, like I was about to talk about the Cowboy Cerrone fight. There's a mixture between up-and-comers, and there's a mixture between older fighters, but still, point being, Jim Miller isn't taking on nobody's, except maybe his last fight, right? He did have one hiccup against Alexander Hernandez, which, to be honest with you, kind of shocked me. I don't know what I was going on that fight, but yeah, you know what? It was a loss there, but then he bounced back with a really, really quick KO over Jesse Butler, and then a very quick win over Gabriel Benitez. He still looked great. Jim Miller still looks great. I am so quick on this channel. If you guys follow the channel at all, I am so quick to go, ooh, this guy's 40. This guy's 40. I'm not picking him. But Jim Miller, everything still looks on point. He's still the techniques there, the dogs there, the cardio's there. Jim Miller is defying time, just like Glover Teixeira has been. But the day is coming where it will show. Is that going to be this fight? 
I don't know. He's taking on Bobby Green, who's coming off of a really, really tough loss. Of course, before this, he had a nice two-fight win streak over Tony Ferguson and Grant Dawson. Although, the problem being, I was worried about Bobby Green's age. He's almost 38 years old, but in his last two fights, but that's even just, he's been a really, really active fighter, right? I've been worried because Tony Ferguson, let's, like, look at these, okay? Excuse me. So Drew Dober KO'd him a year ago, right? That was to be expected. Then the Jared Gordon, you had the accidental clash of heads, so we didn't really get a good gauge there. Tony Ferguson, anybody will beat Tony Ferguson at this point in his career. Grant Dawson, the fight lasted, what, 10 seconds? And then, against Challen Turner, he just taunted the whole time until he got knocked out. So I'm having a little bit of an issue kind of figuring out where Bobby Green is in his career because I don't know if it's fair to necessarily say that he took he lost a step because we just haven't seen much of him recently. He's had a lot of fights, but at the same time, we haven't seen a lot of him recently. I hope that makes sense, but Bobby Green, man, he's known as a very, very slick boxer with a very underrated ground game, and he's taken on Jim Miller, a guy who can do absolutely everything, and somehow Jim Miller has developed power in his old age. I don't understand how that's possible, but now he has power. When these two match up, I see Bobby Green having an edge in the striking, but Jim Miller probably could make up for that with the amount of kicks that he could throw. If this fight were to go to the ground, I feel like it would be closer than people would think. I would give the edge to Jim Miller. Jim Miller is a very, very good BJJ fighter. But Bobby Green, again, very, very underrated wrestling. You always have to worry about the power of Bobby Green, but Jim Miller has developed power like I just mentioned. I feel like Jim Miller will chin Bobby Green because we have seen Bobby Green chinned. Not, I, w I don't want to say recently, but it's been a year ago. Drew Dober knocked him out. But then again, here's a question. Drew Dober can knock a lot of people out. Jalen Turner can also knock a lot of people out. But... The point being, Bobby Green, we know he can be knocked out. Jim Miller can be as well, but I see Jim Miller rising to the occasion. I would imagine motivation would never be higher. That's just me personally because Jim Miller would want to win at USA 300. The dude's just crazy at 40 years old, and I'm so going against myself and picking a 40-year-old here, but I'm going to pick Jim Miller. I think Jim Miller's going to catch him with a shot and get another highlight real KO. Moving on to the most controversial fight of the night, people who don't think is UFC 300 worthy, but guys, you got to think about it, to be honest with you, where you know we're going to have some WMA fighters on the card. I'm okay with this personally. We have Jessica Andrade taking on Marina Rodriguez. You have Jessica Andrade. I'll start with her because she has had a little bit of a rough go with a recent win in her career because it's a little bit tough to get. She's 32 years old. She's been fighting for a very, very long time, still in her primer, like just exiting her prime. We all know what we get with Jessica Andrade. She is a bully in there. She comes in. She wants to swing hard. She actually has power for the women's strawweight division, which you don't see too often. She's very tough. She is very good at being the hammer, but has a little bit of an issue being the nail. Like I said, you know exactly what you're getting with Jessica Andrade. She's coming off of a really, really tough three-fight losing skid, but it is important to note this losing skid she had, and it's a little bit tough because it's more than losing skid. She got outclassed and dominated by these fighters, okay? All three, Aaron Blanchfield, Jan Jelnan, and Tatiana Suarez. She bounced back with a nice win against Mackenzie Dern. In this fight, she finally, finally looked a little bit more like herself, but it is important to note that I did notice in this fight is she wasn't nearly as aggressive as she used to be. The power was there. She really, really got to Dern with the power, but... At this, like at this point in her career, her age says that she's just exiting her prime, but I believe from what I've seen in her recent performances and even in the dominant, I don't want to say dominant win, but even in the win over Mackenzie Dern, she's out of her prime. This is not the same Jessica Andrade. A lot of people have been saying that Jessica Andrade at this point in her career has been just coming in looking for paychecks. I actually don't mind that. I don't see the same heart from Jessica Andrade, but she's taken on Marina Rodriguez, who is a very, very good stand-up striker, likes to use her range over here. She is going to be the taller fighter by a lot, and she's going to have a good amount of range. Or I don't want to—I don't know why I said that. So excuse me, guys. She's going to have a little bit of a reach advantage, and she uses her range very well. So what I meant to say is that matters. It really, really matters when Marina Rodriguez has a nice reach advantage over you. She's 36 years old, which is a little bit of an issue, but she's still looking good for her age in the strawweight division. She finally broke a two-fight losing streak to Amanda Lemos and Vernana Jan Janarobia, excuse me. And then she got a really, really nice win over Michelle Waters and Gomez. But the problem being, at this point, anybody in the entire world can beat Michelle Waters and Gomez. She murdered her. That was completely to be expected. Gomez does not have it anymore. She is not the same fighter that she once was. And she shouldn't even arguably be in the strawweight weight class. So, a little bit tough to say how Marina Rodriguez is going to show up this time around. But, you can't count Jessica Andrade out. 
I don't think she's going to be able to knock out Marina Rodriguez. She's going to come in. She's going to want to bully Marina Rodriguez. But Marina will probably have the striking defense to kind of stay on the outside of Jessica Andrade. If this was a few years ago, I would probably pick Andrade to win. But again, I just haven't been impressed by the way she's shown up. I still like Marina Rodriguez. I still think she's hungry to get the wins. I still, We obviously know that this girl still wants a title. While we question it with Jessica Andrade, she's going to have the size advantage. The only thing that she doesn't have is the age advantage, which that age is going to start showing, but it hasn't shown yet. I think she might be able to piece up Jessica Andrade like we've seen in her recent performances. I'm going to pick Marina Rodriguez to get the win here. Moving on to the final edition of UFC 300, we have Jalen Turner taking on Renato Moicano. And this is a great fight. Mike, putting Moni Moicano down on UFC 300 was a very, very good move by the UFC, in my opinion. So this is a very interesting fight because you have Moicano, and I'll start with him. He came back after a very, very long layoff. I don't remember exactly how long it was, but okay, it wasn't, it wasn't as long as I thought it was. But regardless, he beat Drew Dober in a fight that I'm very high on Drew Dober. I think Drew Dober is a great fighter, especially now in Drew Dober's career. He got through a war. He used his grappling to get the edge there. And we know what we're going to get with Moicano. It's like it's a good striking game with a primary, of course, top game and grappler. He wants to get you down. He wants to beat you up from there. And he's very, very good at doing so. He's, as of recently, he's only had one hiccup loss against Rafael DeSanjos. And that honestly makes a lot of sense for the matchup there. But other than that, Renato Moicano has been looking very, very good in his career. The wins are a little bit questionable for names because I think Jalen Turner is, or excuse me, Jalen Turner is better than these fighters that he's been taking on. But we know we're getting Mukano. He's a very, very good. He has an all. He's a nice all-round game man. Jalen Turner, on the other hand, broke a surprising, in my opinion, it's surprising that he lost two in a row. He came into the UFC. He's been here for a while now, and he got. Uh, he's been getting nice, nice finishes. People were looking at this guy like he's going to be champion, but then he ran into Mateusz Gamrot. And Dan Hooker, both of these are split decision losses, but it is important to know, at least my opinion, I would love to know what you guys think down below in the comment section if you disagree. I believe that he did lose both of these fights. I didn't think it should have been a split decision. I gave it both to Dan Hooker and Mateusz Gamera, but of course, he bounced back with a beautiful, beautiful knockout win over Bobby Green. With Jalen Turner, or excuse me, I don't know why I keep saying Jalen, excuse me, sorry about that. Jalen Turner, we know what we're getting. Very, very rangy striker, very powerful with a little bit of a hole in the ground game, okay? Moicano is out of his prime now, and I think it showed a little bit in his last fight. He still looked good, don't get me wrong, but Jalen Turner will have a three-inch reach advantage on him. He will have a massive height advantage on him, and I think that Jalen Turner, like we were just kind of talking about with Marina Rodriguez, it matters when Jalen Turner has that reach advantage on you. He's very, very snappy with his punches. It's like a little bit of... I don't want to compare him to Kevin Holland because he's a better fighter than Kevin Holland. But you know when you watch people strike and Kevin Holland just has that snap to his shot that can knock you out? Jalen Turner kind of has the same thing, so it's very, very dangerous. The question is, can Moicano get Jalen Turner to the ground, or is Jalen Turner going to get a knockout? For me personally, I'm going to avoid betting on that fight for this reason. And while I know Moicano can strike, this is going to kind of end up being a grappler versus striker matchup, in my opinion. I think that... It's more likely that Moicano gets to his legs and takes him down to the ground. Because again, we have seen that little bit of a hole with Jalen Turner. But it would not shock me at all if Jalen Turner ended up getting the KO. So this is a very close fight in my opinion. But for my official prediction, when these two match up, I think it is more likely that Moicano ends up getting a takedown on Turner. And maybe either, I don't know about submitting him, but at least riding him out to decision. But even then, if you can't submit Jalen Turner, each round is going to start back up on the feet and... Jalen Turner will be live for a knockout. It's going to be a very, very fun fight to watch. So I'm very interested. Comment down below what you think about this fight. But I am going to give a very, very slight lean to Hinato Moicano to get the job done. Moving on to the next fight, guys. I'm literally so excited for every single fight on this card. I swear, man. Like, it is a great, great fight. Now we have Sadiq Yusuf taking on Diego Lopez. Dream big and make it happen. I am a big, big Diego Lopez fan, man. I have officially been convinced of Diego Lopez since he came to the UFC. Well, not since he came to the UFC. Eyes were all on him because, of course, we know Diego Lopez has had a little bit of a, what do you call it, like a little bit of a hiccupy history when it comes to his fights. He doesn't always get the job done, but all of a sudden he comes into the UFC, he gets his chance. He made Movsar Evluev look human. He, not that he didn't look human, but you get the point. He almost got the win over Movsar Evluev, and that's what everybody was like, oh my god, this guy's beating Movsar. And that has only aged well because Movsar is still going on to beat guys like Arnold Allen. But then... He fought both Gavin Tucker and Pat Sabatini. Gavin Tucker, you make of that win what you will, but Pat Sabatini, I'm literally officially convinced that Diego Lopez 
is the real deal. I'm not convinced he's championship material, but he is fantastic at what he does. Like, even in this last fight, just three months ago, Sabatini came in, tried to take him down. Diego had great defense, reversed the position. He looked great on, and Diego even finished him with a KO blow. Like, this dude has a wonderful, wonderful all-round skill set. He's in his prime right now. He's on a roll. I love watching Diego Lopez, man. Comes in, people think he's a grappler, but he's been showing that he definitely can stand and bang with the best. Sadiq Youssef is definitely a guy who would be standing and banging with the best because this guy is a very, very good and explosive, powerful striker. This dude's technique is wild. Youssef is a great, great striker, okay? Not completely useless on the ground, but of course, Sadiq Youssef will definitely want this on the feet, okay? He has put together a... He's been like quietly rolling around in the UFC. Of course, he had one loss to Arnold Allen, but he did look good in this performance, but then he bounced back with two really nice wins and of course had an amazing, amazing performance and fight against Edson Barboza. So even in both of these losses that Sadiq Youssef has had in the UFC and Arnold Allen and Edson Barboza, I don't take anything away from him. I think they were great performances, and I think Sadiq Youssef showed that he definitely belongs within the ranked of the featherweight division. I think he's great. So these two, when they match up, what's going to happen? I have questions about Diego Lopez's striking. Can he hang with a guy like Sadiq Youssef? I have the same question for Sidiq Youssef. Can he hang with the grappling of Diego Lopez? My assumption would be that Lopez would definitely have the grappling advantage when it comes to this fight. Takedowns, wrestling, whatever Diego Lopez wants to do. I would imagine that that's an option he can explore. But Sadiq Youssef, I don't know if he's going to be able to outstrike Diego Lopez. Because like I said, man, I'm on the hype train. I'm convinced of Diego Lopez. Logic dictates that Sadiq Youssef would have the striking advantage. But I just, something's telling me that Diego will be able to hang with him. So, that leads me to looking at the stats, which are very, very similar. Both guys are in their prime. Like, this is a fantastic fight, man. This is an absolutely fantastic fight. It's one of those fights that, against two guys that are on a roll, it's a shame that one of them have to lose. I'm going to pick Diego Lopez to win. Not a confident pick, but I'm going to pick Diego Lopez to win because I believe that ground game option will be there for him to explore. And I would imagine the crowd's going to be on Diego Lopez, to be honest with you, and he might thrive from that. So I'm going to give a slight lean to Diego Lopez. I'm kind of like a 60-40 in this one, but Sadiq Youssef is also a fantastic fighter. Great matchmaking by the UFC. Moving on to the next fight. Everybody's calling this the bathroom break of the card. And to be honest with you, I kind of agree with it, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> we have Holly Holm taking on UFC newcomer Kayla Harrison. A lot of people wanted to see Kayla Harrison coming to the UFC for a very, very long time. She's 33 years old right now. Missed a little bit of a majority of her career, but she's been doing great things outside the UFC. I say great with a grain of salt because I have never been really impressed with her. She is just a roid rage grappler who takes down and controls people. That's pretty much how her fights go, and especially against Aspen Ladd, but Ladd sucked. Like I've always said with Kayla Harrison, somebody with decent striking and takedown defense could beat her, and that could certainly be Holly Holm, but the problem being, Holly Holm's pushing 43 years old. Holly Holm's 15-6 and six now at this point in her career. Has had ups, has had downs, has taken on the best of the Bantamweight division, but beating the best of the Bantamweight division really says absolutely nothing, to be honest with you. She just got standing submitted by Myra Bueno Silva, but it got overturned into a no contest. I don't know what to think of this fight, man. I don't know what to think of it this fight, because if this was a Holly Holm in her prime, I'd pick her over Kayla Harrison all day. I really would, because Holly Holm has the takedown defense, and she has good striking to do exactly what I said, like, is the recipe to beat Kayla Harrison, which is have takedown defense and good striking, because Kayla Harrison would lose to that, but Holly Holm is not nearly the same fighter as she once was. She's 42 years old right now, pushing 43. She holds on to you in the clinch. She doesn't do a lot. She screams. I don't know how Kayla Harrison's going to look on the other hand, because uh, I don't know exactly how much weight she's cutting, but apparently... There is a huge, huge deal. Well, not even apparently. that It is a huge deal. People are constantly talking about Kayla Harrison and whether or not she can make weight. Is that going to be a question? Is this fight even going to happen? How drained is Kayla Harrison going to be? Because if she shows up like a skeleton and for the first time cutting down 135 pounds because apparently she can't do it, but apparently she's going to make it happen. I don't know what to think, man. I don't know what to think because that could just make you chinny. It could make you sick. She could not perform. Then Holly Holm could head kick her, have another Ronda Rousey moment. I don't know what to think. <laughs> I don't know what to think, dude. If Kayla Harrison shows up and she's okay from the weight cut, I'm going to pick her to win. I think she'll just use her roid rage to grab Holly Holm, take her down to the ground. I think that's what's going to happen. She's going to grind out to a decision. But that's a big if. 
That's a big if if she shows up. Because look, she's 150 pounds in her last fight. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. She's a big girl, big steroid girl. She is. She there's nothing special about her though. So yeah, I don't know what to think about this fight, guys. I'm gonna pick Kayla Harrison, but it's a 50-50. Moving on to the next fight, we have Calvin Cater versus Aljamain Sterling. First important note is this is Aljamain Sterling going up a division to 145 pounds. So. That is a huge problem in itself. We don't know how Aljamain Sterling is going to look. Sometimes these guys go up in weight, they look great. Sometimes the size is a little bit too much for him. And you can see that Aljamain Sterling will definitely be the shorter guy in this bout. But, man, all right, let's start with Aljamain Sterling. We know the drill with Aljamain Sterling. He has had a very, very nice win streak as champion, but they all come with their own set of asterisks, okay? Piotr Jan beat him, knocked him out, illegal knee. Then you have Piotr Jan, split decision. I personally thought Aljamain Sterling won the fight, but there's definitely controversy there. TJ Dillashaw. TJ Dillashaw had no arm. Henry Cejudo. Henry Cejudo, with this fight, it could have gone either way. And I don't have a preference for that one. The fight ended, and I was like, and sorry about my dog, she's just eating her foot. But <laughs> when that fight ended, I literally looked at the people I was watching and was like, I have no clue who won that. Like, that was that close of a fight. And then, of course, you have the Sean O'Malley loss, but... This was a fight where he was likely injured. The UFC wanted him to take this fight, and he ended up getting knocked out. So literally every single one of these has a little bit of an issue with it with Aljamain Sterling. But Aljamain Sterling, of course, like with many fighters on this card, we know what we're getting. He is a grappler with striking that doesn't work. He keeps go. The only reason that he can hang with people is because he drops his knees on the ground and then does like the Mohamed Mokayev type thing. Or I guess it's like the Aljamain Sterling thing. Mohamed Mokayev kind of copied that. He drops down so he can't get murdered in the head, and he starts doing the crawl thing, which should definitely be illegal. Well, they should just allow knees to ground at opponents, but that's really Aljamain Sterling striking. Other than that, he can't strike. It was shown to Sean O'Malley, and I know Sean O'Malley is a fantastic striker, but Calvin Cater will be a better striker, okay? That, absolutely. Now, another thing about Calvin Cater moving on to his record is he is better than his 23-7 and seven record. He's better than his three losses, okay? Calvin Cater is a very, very good fighter. He is mainly a boxer with, he can add a few kicks here and there, but we rarely, rarely see Calvin Cater go to the ground. This is definitely going to be one of those grappler versus striker matchups, but I'm unsure about how Calvin Cater will stack up against Aljamain Sterling, but I want to talk about his record because, of course, he's looked great in some fights and some fights where Max Holloway, he got completely styled on, but then you're looking into three years ago. The Giga Chikadze win, he looked really good there. The Josh Emmett win, or loss, excuse me, was absolutely 100% a robbery. He won this fight, and he should remain, like, that should, that is a complete 100% robbery in that fight. It was horrible what they did to him there. And, of course, the Arnold Allen, we didn't really get to see anything because, of course, he injured his knee. Now, what's important to note is there's a little bit of something coming into these fighters because you have Calvin Cater coming off of, over a year ago, a knee injury. I don't remember the specifics of the knee injury, but it was really, really bad. He's been off, and... You got a question. When he's coming back, is he going to be tentative? Is the knee going to hurt if Aljamain Sterling kicks it? Is Calvin Cater going to be willing to go in there and really tough it out? If I had to guess, knowing Calvin Cater, he would be. But coming off of an injury like that really makes me worry for fighters. And he's 36 years old now, so I don't know how much he's been training. Aljamain Sterling, how's he going to do with this new weight class? I have no clue because if I had to assume, he'd be a little bit over undersized. He's probably going to weigh around the same, but like Calvin Cater already has the height advantage, and Calvin Cater has a little bit of a reach advantage, but he's if they stand up, Calvin Cater will box his face off. I don't know with the new weight class if Aljamain Sterling can get a hold of Calvin Cater and take him down. That's my big question. That's why it's such an interesting fight because, again, you have this grappler versus striker type matchup. Stays on the feet. If Aljamain Sterling is unable to take Calvin Cater down, Calvin is going to piece him up, and that's assuming that Calvin Cater is okay with his knee. And I don't even know if Aljamain Sterling, let's say he does get Calvin Cater to the ground. I don't know if he's going to be able to really control like he usually does. So it's a very, very interesting fight in that sense. But for my official prediction, I will be picking Calvin Cater in this matchup. The knee really worries me. The age is starting to worry me because, again, you're in the featherweight division. You're 36 years old coming off of an injury. I don't necessarily really like that. But I just think when these two match up, I think Calvin Cater could really, really piece up Aljamain Sterling and maybe, maybe finding a finish. I'm going to pick Calvin Cater right here. Moving on to the next fight, which just got booted off the <laughs> off the main card, which is shocking to me. You have Yuri Prohoshka versus Alexander Rakic. Now, guys, a lot of people are worried about because this is Rakic taking on Yuri Prohoshka that this is going to be a boring fight. First of all, I don't find Rakic boring one little bit. Secondly, 
Tell me a fight that Yuri's been in that's been boring. This is going to be a banger. This is UFC 300 worthy. I'm very excited for this fight. So you have Yuri Prohoshka, who has looked like an absolute killer coming into the UFC, right? He went all the way to becoming a champion very, very quickly. He's only had four UFC fights, which is crazy, but he's looked very dominant in a lot of them, except the Glover Teixeira fight. He showed how well, even in the Dominic Reyes fight too, he showed that his heart is just absolutely on another level. Now, Alex Pereira finally ended up KOing him in a fight that I kind of thought was a 50-50 fight. I don't know about you guys, okay? Comment down below if you think differently. I don't think Yuri looked like himself in this fight. I'm not excusing the loss. Don't get me wrong. I'm not like putting up any sort of excuse for it, but Yuri just, I don't know. I don't know. Something was rubbed me the wrong way about that performance. He ended up getting knocked out and there were controversy around the stoppage, but Yuri did say that he did go out and one ended up being a good stoppage. He's taking on Alexander Rakic, who's coming off of quite a long layoff because he fought Jan Blachowicz. He was well on his way to winning and then ended up blowing his knee out. So the same kind of things come up here like I was just talking about with Calvin Cater, right? You always have to worry about how much they've been training, how their knee's going to be, their confidence level, especially getting thrown into a firefight that Yuri is going to put on you. That's a big issue. That's a really, really big issue. We got to worry about a lot of stuff when people are coming off of that. But before that, coming off of two really, really dominant wins over Tiago Santos and Anthony Smith, ended up losing a split decision loss to Vulcan Ozdemir, but you're getting into four years ago now, and he absolutely won this fight. That was a robbery, and of course, he had the beautiful Jimmy Manoa head kick, but again, Alexander Rakic has been a very, very inactive fighter. Same with Yuri, which is very interesting. You have 32 years old versus 31, and interestingly enough, these two are going to be similar in size because Rakic usually kind of towers over his opponents. He's, and this is another thing that's important to note, is he is very, very good at staying on the outside and using his reach, and he's a very, very huge, safe fighter. He can absolutely mix in the grappling, but he prefers to just stay on the outside and kind of pick you apart the way that he can. He's a very safe heavyweight for as big of a guy as he is, and he does have knockout power, but you don't see it too often. So the reason that I brought up the reach is because, again, he really, really likes to use his reach. He's actually going to have a reach disadvantage in this fight, and that's going to be very important to note. But Yuri does have a little bit of a wild man swings, so I can see Alexander Rakic being really, really composed and like kind of jabbing his face off a little bit. Very, very good jab, strong jab from Alexander Rakic. So, oh man, this is a tough fight. This is a really tough fight. You got a question because Yuri finally had his lights put out. How's his chin going to be? And Rakic isn't exactly a guy who doesn't hit hard. He has the knockout power. He just is, like I said, he's a very, very safe fighter. Rakic can definitely explore the grappling, but Yuri is explosive enough where I can kind of think that he would be okay if Rakic didn't end up going for takedowns. So it leaves this question, is it going to be one of those Yuri performances? Yuri just comes in and makes chaos and whatever happens, happens. Excuse me, I was probably lagging a little bit there. My apologies. So yeah, this is another one of those fights that's really tough to predict. You have two really, really great fighters, and you have you always got a question when Yuri fights because he's going to make the fight super chaotic. I worry about Alexander Rakic coming off of an injury, but at the end of the day, both these guys are in their primes. I worry about Yuri's chin too. So this, in my opinion, is another 50-50 fight. If you had a gun to my head, I would pick Alexander Rakic just because he is the more safe fighter. I could see Yuri swinging a lot and Alexander Rakic kind of, and I'm not saying like Yuri swinging completely wild. I'm just saying that Rakic will be more composed. He'll be ready for what Yuri's going to throw at him. And I would imagine that it's, I would like to see these guys really face off because I would imagine Rakic would appear to be the bigger guy. I don't know, man. Very, very tough fight to pick, but I'm going to ever so slightly lean just because I have to make a prediction for the video. Other than that, I think it's a 50-50 fight. I think Alexander Rakic is going to get the job done. Now, guys, apologies for putting a little bit of a pause on the video here. I do need to advertise the channel membership if you are interested. I am going to be betting so much on this card. I already know it. I already see a lot of spots of value, which is very fun. So if you are interested in seeing my official bets every Thursday or Friday before UFC events, I will make a YouTube post about my actual bets and then a member video, members only video, explaining my confidence level and the reasoning for why I place my bets. If you're interested in seeing exactly where I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Check out the channel membership, like I said, and it is very cheap compared to other channels. Thank you very much for your time. Let's get into the main card. Moving on to the main card, we have Charles Oliveira versus Armin Sarukian. This is a UFC 300 fight right here. This fight I cannot wait for. You have Charles Oliveira, who is coming off after his loss against Islam Makachev, is coming off of a beautiful win against Benil Darius. He got taken down, beat up just a little bit, but Charles Oliveira, in Charles Oliveira fashion, found his way to his feet, and found a beautiful, beautiful KO. Before that, 
of course, he had the dominant loss to Islam Makachev, but that's really no problem there. Everybody loses to Islam Makachev, and then he beat Justin Gaethje, beat Dustin Poirier, and beat Michael Chandler. And those fights were a little bit of wars, but Charles Oliveira came in. He got the job done. Charles Oliveira is a very, very technical striker who has no problems getting into a war. Charles can do everything. He's very dangerous on the ground, very dangerous on the feet, has power in his hands. He will throw every single thing into his strikes, and what I mean by that is jabs, elbows, knees. You never know what's coming with Charles Oliveira. This guy is the complete package for a fighter. The only, only weakness he could have is his durability, but he oftentimes gets up from whenever you knock the guy down. <laughs> so Charles Oliveira is a very good fighter. He's taken on Armin Sarukian, who is a very, very dominant grappler with power in his hands and very underrated striking. This dude is also championship material. He can do it all just like Charles Oliveira, but I will say Charles definitely has the edge in the striking, in my opinion, just because of the different dynamics that they throw. Like Charles Oliveira definitely has the more options, but man, Armin Sarukian has been on an absolute roll since he came to the UFC. The only loss he has is against Mateusz Gamera, but my, I, a lot of people, myself included, gave the win to Armin Sarukian. Regardless, this was one of the most high-level fights you will ever see in MMA, and it was a pleasure to watch. Stock went up either way, and then after that, it's been more domination. He dominated Is Demir Ismagulov, which was shocking to me in my opinion. The Joaquin Silva, we'll talk about that in a second. He ended up getting the win there, and then he obviously just knocked up Benil Darius very quickly. So, I want to talk about the Joaquin Silva loss, because... This is going to play a little bit of a part in my prediction here. He, in the first round, did exactly what he typically does. In, in the second, Silva actually outstruck him, and he actually ended up rocking Armin Sarukin, which is something we've never seen from Armin Sarukin before. I mean, as of recently, right? Armin Sarukin seems to be a completely different fighter since we've seen him recently. But Armin Sarukin ended up surviving, okay? He ended up surviving. He slammed Silva on his head and then just, just came out for vengeance after that. So what sh this shows me is that for the first time we've seen Armin Sarukian in a world of hurt, he overcame that, and he came back to get the win. Here's the problem, though. Here's the problem, though, because he was hurt here. He did get the job done, but it really makes me worry for people who are able to rock him because you do see a little bit of a hole there, and after you rock Armin Sarukian, what happens if you can stuff the takedowns? I feel like if Charles Oliveira is a guy to... Rock Armin Sarukin, which is a huge possibility, and Armin goes to take down Charles Oliveira for like a little bit of safety, which would probably be the smart decision, right? Because you don't want to keep banging it out with Charles Oliveira. I feel like, first of all, Charles Oliveira, the submission threat's there, but if Armin Sarukin's even dazed, Charles Oliveira has all the options in the world. He can beat you up, he can submit you. I feel like it, it, it's a lot more dangerous getting rocked by Charles Oliveira than it is against Joaquin Silva. And Joaquin Silva, like, it's tough to say because, like I said, I said so many good things about Armin Sarukin coming back and surviving in that moment. But if that happens against Charles Oliveira, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because I can see it happening, Charles might actually end up finish, finishing this fight. So Charles Oliveira, another thing to note is he's 34 years old. The day is going to come where he's slowing down, but that is not right now nearly one bit. It looks like Charles Oliveira is going to be the bigger fighter in there. Armin Sarukin has not even hit his prime yet. He's improving every single time we see him. He has all the confidence in the world. He wants to be a champion. Charles Oliveira is hungry for that Islam Makachev rematch. He looked like an absolute killer against Benil Dariush. This is a very, very tough fight. I can see both guys winning because I really do believe both of these guys to be championship level fighters. I think both guys are perfect. Not perfect, but you get the point. Like, I think both guys are as good as you can get in the lightweight division. You could throw them against Islam Makachev, and both of them can beat him at any day. But I believe it's more likely that Charles Oliveira will hurt Armin Sarukian at some point. I don't know how he'll hurt him, but even if Armin wants to come in and wrestle, Charles Oliveira is very dangerous off his back. I don't think Charles will submit him, but I think what's going to happen is at some point, Charles is going to hurt Armin Sarukian, and then when Armin Sarukian starts panic shooting for takedowns, and I don't mean to say panic shooting isn't like he just spams takedowns, he's going to probably want to get a takedown after he gets rocked by Charles Oliveira, and then Charles Oliveira will find some sort of either transition and sweep him, or Charles Oliveira will submit him. I just see a huge difference in the danger level of Charles Oliveira compared to Armin Sarukian, and Charles Oliveira, he's been in firefights before, man. He's seen people like Armin Sarukian before, and I know that he lost to Islam Makachev, but man... Charles is an absolute dog in there. I can see this fight going both ways. I'm not counting on Armin Sarukin at all. I'm picking Charles Oliveira with like a 75-25 level of confidence. But at the end of the day, 
Give me Charles Oliveira to win the fight. I cannot wait to watch this. Moving on to the almost featured fight on the main card, we have Bo Nickel taking on Cody Brundage. Did we think that we'd see this on the main card of UFC 300? Absolutely not. I know, honestly, I know a lot of people are complaining about this, but the card's so stacked, I don't even care. I really don't. But anyways, Bo Nickel, okay? Bo Nickel, he's coming to the UFC. He's had a perfect run so far. He's had very, very quick fights. He's a very strong wrestler, and he's showed now that he has power behind his hands, and it is important to note in the Val Woodburn fight, <laughs> the strikes were very sloppy, very, very sloppy, so I don't know if that's the case typically, but the point being, Bo Nickel is very unexperienced in professional MMA, depending on, I know that he's been doing a lot of training, he's very, very, he's outside of the UFC, he has accomplished a lot of things, especially in wrestling, right? I just don't know exactly where he falls into place yet. Cody Brundage unfortunately, is one of the worst fighters in the UFC. That's what I do believe, and I don't hate Cody Brunage. I think he actually gets a little bit too much hate, but he's coming off of two wins in the Jacob Malkoon one, and in both of these fights, I lost money. <laughs> I think that's also why people really don't like Cody Brunage right now, but anyways, in the Jacob Malkoon fight, he was getting murdered, and then he ended up pulling an Aljamain Sterling and got a DQ win, and then Zach Reese. Zach Reese, everybody was high on. I was pretty high on Zach Reese. And he ended up, he, I can't believe he got caught in a submission and he slammed Zach Reese. That was one of the biggest upsets ever. I am done betting against Cody Brundage. I am done losing my money against this man. I can't believe it. And I bet on him too against, uh, who was it? I bet, against, I bet on him to beat Cedricus Dumas. And I, pff, Dumas sucks, man. Dumas sucks, and he beat Cody Brunage. Like, this doesn't make any sense, man. Anyways, I'm done losing money on Cody Brunage. The values on Cody Brunage, because the likelihood that something crazy will happen here is very high, in my opinion. But, <laughs> of course, you have two guys who are primary wrestlers going at it. Bo Nichols, obviously going to be the better wrestler. Cody Brunage comes in. He doesn't really have the striking to really hang in the UFC, and he doesn't have the gas tank to hang in the UFC. He does, and don't get me wrong, he is a good wrestler, but I feel like Bo Nickel will be able to outdo him in that department. The question being, who's going to win the striking exchanges? I don't really know. If Cody Brunage can somehow match Bo Nickel in the wrestling exchanges, then you will see one of those classic grapplers turn into strikers thing, and what I've seen from Bo Nickel so far in the striking department, I don't exactly love. Their age is the same. Bo Nickel will have a nice reach advantage, but again, is he really going to use it? We don't know. There's a lot of questions about this fight, and... I am done putting my money anywhere near Cody Brundage. I don't care if it's against him. I don't care if it's for him. I'm done. <laughs> Cody Brundage is live for an upset, but of course, I do think Bo Nickel will ultimately get the win. He does have, he does look promising, especially from the ground game that we've seen so far. I'm going to pick Bo Nickel to get the win. The UFC obviously wants him to get a big win on a big stage at UFC 300. Moving on to the featured fight, we have Justin Gaethje taking on Max Holloway. Now, Max Holloway is moving up to the lightweight division at 155 pounds for the second time in his career. This is a five-round fight for the BMF title. Max Holloway, it is important to note that last time he moved up to, and that's not the Dustin Poirier loss. What was I doing? I forgot the Alexander Volkanovski loss was in the middle of his recent record. I'm just used to Max Holloway winning. <laughs> that probably looks so bad on me. Oh my God. But anyways, Last time he moved up to 155 pounds, it was a very, very close fight with Dustin Poirier. It is important to note that everybody is remembering that fight incorrectly. Dustin Poirier had a lot of issues with Max Holloway, and it was a lot closer of a fight than we think it was. The only really big takeaway at 155 pounds is it was evident that Dustin Poirier's power was getting to Max Holloway. So a lot of people are saying, because Justin Gaethje obviously hits harder than Dustin Poirier, is more technical than Dustin Poirier, and will be more likely to land then Dustin Poirier, that Justin Gaethje is going to chin Max Holloway, and Max Holloway is going to end up going out like Volkanovski went out. I don't necessarily think that's the case. Max Holloway did not have time the first time to bulk up to lightweight, because if you would see pictures of Max Holloway right now, he looks great. He looks huge. Max Holloway looks scary right now. Uh, point being, the first fight that he had lightweight with Dustin Poirier was not a good representation, and people are remembering that fight incorrectly. That's the most important thing to come that, to take away from this. But other than that, Max Holloway went on to do great things. Of course, his only losses being to Alexander Volkanovsky, right? He dominated Calvin Cater. Did, had a really good performance against Yair Rodriguez. Of course, got dominated by Volkanovsky, beat Arnold Allen, and dominated Chan Sung Jung, the Korean zombie, which is still sad to see. But anyways, 
Justin Gaethje all of a sudden turned into one of the most technical fighters in the division, strikers. He, after a couple suffering a couple losses, just turned it up. All of his technique. He's been looking really good. The Michael Chandler fight was sloppy, but Charles Oliveira, he had his moments in there. And then Hayens, Rafael Fazeev, and Dustin Poirier, he looked absolutely fantastic. He's no longer the Justin Gaethje that I'll take two to give you one. He is a Justin Gaethje that comes in here and uses strategic movement, places his shots with precision, accuracy, and amazing, amazing power with them. He's 35 years old now, so here's the question too. One of these days, Justin Gaethje is going to show up not looking so good. With his age and all of the damage that he's taken in his career, that day is coming and that day is coming fast. Will it be this fight? I don't know. He hasn't shown that yet, which is shocking in my opinion. But other than that, it's really weird to see Max Holloway is going to have a reach disadvantage. So that's something a little bit important to note there because Max is very, very good at using his reach. This is a really tough fight to break down. Because, again, while I did say that everybody is remembering that Dustin Poirier fight incorrectly against Max Holloway, the power was affecting Max Holloway. And Justin Gaethje is not a guy you want to get hit by. He swings everything into his punches. It's like getting hit with a baseball bat. I can see a world where everybody, like everybody's saying right now, that Justin Gaethje is going to chin Max Holloway. I can see that happening. It wouldn't shock me if that happened at all. But... I also see a world where this goes five rounds and Holloway just puts a pace on Justin Gaethje because especially as Justin Gaethje with the fight gets on and they start like going to war a little bit, Justin does have those tendencies and we did see that in the Michael Chandler fight. He gets caught up. He starts winging punches so hard that he throws himself over and falls like that's Justin Gaethje. So we still do see those tendencies come out of Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway is the type of guy that can bring that out of Justin Gaethje. I see a world where this fight goes five rounds, Justin has his moments. It's a very close first couple rounds, but as it gets into round three, four, and five, I see Max Holloway really frustrating Justin Gaethje. I see Justin Gaethje winging and winging and winging shots, and Max Holloway just pat, 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 pat hitting him over and over again, just like we typically see Max Holloway. Plus, we don't know if Max Holloway is going to have power at this weight class. Again, he's finally properly bulking up. He's still in his prime, just exiting his prime. It's going to be very, very fun to see. My point being, guys, is this is a much, much closer fight than people are making it out to be. Everyone's thinking Justin Gaethje is going to come here and just chin Max Holloway. Could happen. Could happen. Absolutely. But this is a fantastic matchup. I don't know who to pick, man. I'm actually kind of leaning towards Max Holloway. I really am. The problem is I can see both guys having success, right? Both of them are so good at what they do. Another thing is Justin Gaethje could really take advantage of the leg kicks. And because Max Holloway is, of course, heavy on that front leg. I don't know, man. I don't know. Justin Gaethje does have fantastic leg kicks, by the way. And all of a sudden, he has a great head kick, too. <laughs> oh, man. You have the technical brawler that's Justin Gaethje taking on Max Holloway, who is a beautiful volume striker. Has all the cardio in the world. Has been opening up the wrestling game as of recently, too. I don't know, man. I can't see him taking down Justin Gaethje. It's definitely going to be a stand-up war. I, I just think Max Holloway might be quicker, man. Oh, tough fight, tough fight. I am like 60-40 on Max Holloway for this. It's just I got a little bit of a gut feeling Max Holloway's going to get it done. My official prediction, guys, is going to be Max Holloway to get a decision win. Moving on to the co-main event, we have the Strawweight Championship. We have Wei Li Zhang taking on Yan Zhaonan. Now, I'm a big fan of Wei Li Zhang, guys. I'm a big fan of Wei Li Zhang. It is shocking to me that I see two losses on her, because I think this is by far, like, not even close, by far the greatest women's fighter we've ever seen in Wei Li Zhang. This girl can do it all. She can strike, she has power, she can strike anywhere the fight goes, and she has the grappling to back it up. She's taken on Yan Zhaonan, who is primarily a striker, definitely will not be able to contend with Wei Li in the grappling department. Problem being, the only, <laughs> the only chance that I give Yan in this fight, guys, I'm going to sum it up, is... She needs to get a knockout. She needs to get a knockout because, of course, that's the majority of her wins, right? She actually has a good amount of power for this division. She has really, really good power. She can really chin, and she just chinned Jessica Andrade. But, of course, it is important to note she had two little bit of hiccups over here. But Wei Li Zhang, man, the only reason that I'm bringing up Yan's power is because we've seen Wei Li chinned by Rose. As shocking as it was, Wei Li can get knocked out. Yan could absolutely catch her. But if Yan does not catch her, 
Whaley is going to dominate like she absolutely always does. I think she's a better striker. I think she's a more powerful striker. And I think that she can ragdoll her on the ground. Whaley is going to come in. She's probably going to explore the ground game a lot like the Amanda Lemos fight, which was just honestly a classic Whaley domination. I love watching this girl fight, man. And I think she is just better than Yan Janan. The only chance I give her, like I said, is to get a knockout win. But other than that, whaley has got this. Whaley's going to come in. If she wants a strike, she'll outstrike her. If she wants a grapple, she'll ragdoll her, possibly find a submission. Whaley is just the goat of women's MMA. She's so good at what she does. And I think she's going to get the win here. Unless there's some random fluke like we saw with Rose Namajunas. Moving on to the main event, we have Alex Pereira taking on Jamal Hill for the UFC Light Heavyweight Championship of the World. Alex Pereira, only 9-2 and and has accomplished so much in his career. We know where we're getting with Alex Pereira. We know we are getting a very, very dangerous, rangy kickboxer. Very unique kickboxer, by the way, who has a lot of accomplishments uh, even before coming to the UFC. With a ground game that is ever-improving, trained by Glover Teixeira. Alex Pereira has only one loss so far, excuse me, one loss as in recent history to Israel Adesanya, and that was shocking to me. I can't believe he lost that fight. I can't believe it. Alex Pereira beats Israel Adesanya 9 out of 10 times. He was winning this fight. He could have been overconfident, but still, at the end of the day, he ended up getting the knockout. And then he he got a really nice win over Jan Blachowicz. I shouldn't say nice win. He got a decent win over Jan Blachowicz. It was a close fight. I personally gave it to Alex Pereira, but it was. There's an argument you can make for Jan Blachowicz. Then he actually knocked out Yuri Perhoshka. Yeah. He bulked up to light heavyweight this time around, but he still didn't look nearly as dangerous as he was in the middleweight division. He's taking on Jamal Hill, who's 12-1, and only lost to Paul Craig. After that, he's been on a nice, nice, really, really nice win streak over, and then he became champion over Glover Teixeira. He beat Glover Teixeira pretty much the entire time, but that was a Glover that, in my opinion, the age finally hit him. But regardless, it's nothing to take away. Glover defied father time for so long. Jamal Hill ended up getting the win. You have a boxer in Jamal Hill taking on a kickboxer of Alex Pereira. Now, guys, there absolutely is a world where Jamal Hill chins Alex Pereira. We've seen him chin against Israel Adesanya. We know he can be chin. Alex Pereira, especially, you know that very, very unique stance that he has with his hands out here. He's bouncing around. His chin is out there, dude. His chin is out there to get clipped, and Jamal Hill has the power to be able to chin him. If he doesn't chin him, though, that's where the problems come, because Alex Pereira, I can see, especially with the the stance that Jamal Hill has, that calf kick is open, open, whack, whack. Alex Pereira will chop him down. I think Alex Pereira will be really, really outranging him when it comes to the feet. I know that the size is very similar. They are almost unique, actually, but Alex Pereira will just be using his range much better than Jamal Hill, but Jamal Hill can come in. Jamal Hill can blitz in and catch Poton. I do believe that. If he doesn't catch him, though, I think Alex Pereira will just be better the entire time. I know we haven't seen Jamal Hill knocked out, but I think Alex Pereira could absolutely knock him out. You also got a question because Jamal Hill has been off now for over a year ago, and he's been off with a really, really bad injury. I believe it's Achilles heel. Regardless, he's been in therapy. He hasn't been training nearly as much as we know that he should be training. And he would, Jamal Hill was also talking about what? Getting back into the cage around May or June, I believe. It could be wrong, but this could be early for him. This could be a good opportunity for UFC 300. Is he ready to fight? Has he been training? I don't know. That also goes against Jamal Hill. You always got a question like we were talking about with Calvin Cater. Like we were talking about escaping my memory, but we we're talking about another fighter on the card. Somebody who came back after an injury. You got to worry about that for Jamal Hill, especially a really, really bad injury. I don't know. I actually don't recall if he had surgery. Regardless, it was a very, very long road to recovery. The odds are stacked against Jamal Hill. We don't know if he's ready. We don't know. Again, you got to worry about the confidence level. I worry about that. Alex Pereira has been very, very active. He's almost 37 now, so you got to worry about the age there, but he's shown no signs of slowing down. The day's coming where he's going to slow down, but I don't think that's going to be yet. Alex Pereira, I would imagine, will be outstriking Jamal Hill, and I think that he will end up getting the finish eventually, somewhere maybe around the second or third round. Give me Alex Pereira to get the win in the main event of UFC 300. With that said, guys, that is going to do it for the entire UFC 300 card. I can't wait for this card. Let me know what you think about it, all of it down below. And guys, check out the channel membership. I'm going to be betting a lot on UFC 300, and we constantly make money every week. So check out the channel membership. It is very cheap compared to other channels. But for now, because UFC 300 is a while away, check out this video on screen for you right now. I will see you either there or in the next one, guys. Take care.